Um, I'm a, a writer, di uh, writer director. I just made a film called The Devil's Candy, which is playing here at Sitches. Mm -hmm. um, Can you talk us about um, Devil's Candy? What's it all about? Um, I think it's at its simplest. It's basically about a, a father protecting his daughter from the devil in disguise. Um, mm -hmm. and it's about it's about the evil within. <laughs> I, th I think it harks back to classic religious horror in the sense of um, The Omen or Rosemary's Baby, but it's infused with a really modern sensibility. Um, so it's very, it's kind of very heavy metal and in your face, but in a way it's kind of a, it's kind of classical horror storytelling, which you don't see as often anymore. It's very much about hell on earth, whereas you tend to see a lot of films about ghosts and zombies and vampires and... Um, and this is really about, you know, it's, it's almost as if Earth was a chessboard for a battle between heaven and hell. And it's, um, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's fueled by the idea of the red, the red right hand, which um, in biblical terms is, is Satan's, represents Satan's inability to rise from the underground. So he needs to use humans as vessels to carry out his nefarious deeds. And I just thought that was a really cool idea because I'm always interested in, where evil comes from we all we're all born kind of supposedly kind of innocent and then corruption can happen in various terms whether it's whether it's sort of you know corporate evil or of a more murderous kind and um and so yeah i was just trying to explore that notion in a kind of supernatural way our lead is um ethan Embry, and um the producers of the film um keith calder and jessica Wu, had had distributed a, a film of his or co-distributed a film of his called cheap thrills and um and I, I really, really liked it because he has like an aggression and a, and a genuine damage, but he also was kind of a romantic at heart and he's a, he was a kind of teenage heartthrob in films like Empire Records and Can't Hardly Wait. So I just felt he was a really, a really great mix of sort of fun and damage, which is what the, what, what the character required. And, um, and then the, the villain of the piece, um, Pruitt Taylor Vince, I didn't. I didn't want to cast like a, 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 a typical a typical villain. I wanted to find a, a really great actor that could find kind of the monster inside the man. And, um, and I'd seen him in. A lot, I mean, I've always loved his work, but um, his debut film was in James Mangold's Heavy, and he has a real childlike quality to him and an otherworldliness and a sense of being a fish out of water. Um, and that's that's kind of why I cast him and. There's another girl, Kiara Glasgow, who's a little, uh, who's 12 year old, and she's just, um, she's just like a pocket dynamo. She's, she was in David Cronenberg's Map of, um, Map to the Stars, I think it was called. And um, but yeah, she's like the, you've never seen a 12 year old. Well, she, first, horror films kind of rely on screen, screen queens, but she's like the ultimate 12 year old screen queen. <laughs> um, are you a spiritual person yourself? Like, um, no, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. So that's where, that's why it's fascinating, you know. Oh, like, no. I don't, <laughs> I swear, well, I mean, it's all, it's that's what's kind of that's what's interesting to explore is uh, the the mystery of it all, and I think that's that's what's that's what's relatable to people because we just you know we don't have answers to these things yeah, so yeah. and everyone grapples with like from generation x which is stuck between those two worlds of you know writing essays on paper and now it's <laughs> now i'm so i'm sort of caught between the two we all have a david versus goliath moment just 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 getting the film made i mean i, I wrote so many different drafts oh. um and it was you know it's just it's just just tough to find money and it's it's especially tough to find producers who are who are risk takers at the same time and that's why I, I felt really blessed when I um, sent the sent the script to um, Snoot Films and um, the producers are Keith Calder and Jessica Wu and they um, just recently made an Anomalisa the new Ch Charlie Kaufman oh. film and um, and also like the the guest and your next and they have a they have a reputation for having really savvy commercial instincts but um, com combine with uh, you know a, a kind of risk risk taking sensibility and that seems to happen less and less in a world where it seems to be like 150 million dollar superhero films or kind of formulaic lower budget horror films so I, yeah the film wouldn't have been made without them because um, yeah I mean we kind of had a, a, a shared a kind of creative kinship and they wanted to kind of be bold and it's rare to find that um how beneficial because social media like the I, this is my first time i've been to a film festival so how beneficial is it for you to continue the interview because there are other ways that you can get it out but you know 
Yeah, I think I, th I mean, I think it's incredibly helpful. It's um, you know just the the more people hear about the film, the the better. The, the, the better. Yeah, I mean, it's my it's my baby. I've lost count of the amount of hours that went into it, so I'm, I'll shout it from any kind of rooftop. To, <laughs> I'm like. Yeah. When it's there and you're on the silver screen watching it, can you talk us through that moment of how you're feeling, like yourself, because it's, it's your brain out there, you know? Well, it's sort of the... We only finished it quite recently. It premiered at the Toronto Film Festival and we finished it a few days beforehand, so it was... Um, in many respects, it was kind of an unknown quantity. We'd done some sort of small test screenings, but so my first experience of watching the film on the silver screen with an audience was pure terror. Um, <laughs> just because I was, you know, wanted, wanted confirmation that it was working and the people were gasping in all the right spots. And um, were they? Yeah, yeah, they were. <laughs> so that was that was that was a, a massive relief. And then after after that, and once the initial reviews came in and they were they were positive, then I can sort of re relax into it a little bit more and enjoy enjoy the audience's enjoyment of the film. Can a review make or break your film? Because if you're an independent film without without um, major stars and you're not you're not a franchise or a recognisable brand, then then reviews are really really important. It's like you know the, you want to kind of ride, ride that wave and it helps um, helps create awareness and hopefully cut cut through the clutter because um, there's a lot of lot of films made every year and obviously a lot of horror films and um, and yeah good reviews kind of help help the film poke, poke its head up from me I made two features but even in my short films sort of fashion is is, is a big part in terms of um, color color schemes representing psychology um, so I don't know I don't know whether you've seen the loved ones like you know the 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 villain wears kind of a hot pink pretty a pretty in pink kind of John Hughes-esque kind of dress and it sort of represents her sort of uh, you know the, being a prom queen and the boy has like you know the he's in he's in the blue kind of prom hat and it's um, kind of shiny and I've, I've done the same thing in the Devil's Candy with the villain the villain's outfit he wears kind of a signature red tracksuit which sort of in a way represents his connection to Satan and it has a white strip which is the purity kind of corrupted and then it also has a black strip which is like the blackness within so I kind of try and think about fashion in a story sense but also make really bold fashion choices because both of my films are kind of movie movies and I think it gives me kind of license to push the envelope a little bit when it comes to style. Um, one last question, your fame, uh, you know, uh, your inspiration, film director and, and uh, films, apart from your own. <laughs> uh, I've, got, I've, got, I've got so many, but yeah. um, I mean, I, I, I love David Lynch for his kind of otherworldliness. If I could like take, take the David Lynch um, dreamscape and, and, and marry it with, you know, his, ma marry it with a kind of a... Bruckheimer-esque pace that's kind of and logic or something that's I, I fall somewhere between like Lynch and uh, and a very commercial filmmaker and I'm really excited about trying to marry sort of those two kind of the, those to, those two tones that seem so separate mm. but I think there are ways to kind of blend them.